Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back. Hope you had a nice, uh, Jeannie, we're good? We had a nice break, a nice uh, break for me at least. Uh, so two quick notes on the exam. So first, uh, I need to apologize for the technical problem. So several of you were using MacBook Pros and could not submit. And did you upgrade to El Capitan, the most recent OS? Mine actually did work. Yours did work, did it? Mine did work, but I didn't upload the update. All right, so I, I have, for this, I apologize. Um, I, have, I have no control over the uh, exam soft, but apparently that's some sort of bug that affected <laughs> you. Um, but I hope for those of you who didn't upload, you wrote in a blue book or, 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 or submitted it online or by some method? OK. Okay, because my day students out of about 10 people couldn't submit their papers online. So I have all your papers. I will grade them. Um, just one note. Um, uh, Rebecca mentioned that quite a number of you were actually late to getting here. Um, were I here, I would have excluded you from taking the midterm. Um, don't miss an exam. This is really bad professionalism. I wasn't here, and I have no one who was late, so there's not much I can do about it. But be on time. Um, I understand you have jobs, and I know you have families, but for, especially for an exam, uh, don't be late to that. Um, if you're actually late to your final, there's a good chance they won't let you in. Um, and take these words seriously. Um, in law, you can screw up a lot of things and get by, but missing a deadline is not one of those. Um, if you miss a statute of limitation, that's it. You're done. You're baked, and you have a legal malpractice claim. So for at least the times when we have an exam or a midterm or something, um, make sure you're there in time. Not finding parking is an excuse. Uh, uh, and again, I don't know who was whom, and in fact, I told Rebecca not to tell me, because that would actually defeat the blind grading, which I, at this point I, I will try to adhere to. So please uh, take those words seriously, uh, not just for my class, but for any um, uh, sort of experience with the law. Now, what I'm going to do is this. Um, because you use your blind grading numbers, I don't know who will get what grade. Um, one of the kinks that we're going to have to work out for next year is this. If they give me your name now, I will know your name for the final exam, and that is not good. So what I'm going to do is grade them blindly, and I'll write your score at the top of your paper. I'll leave them with uh, Christina, who's, who's uh, office on the sixth floor across from me. I'll say, okay, go pick up your papers, okay? If you get below a certain grade, I don't know what the grade will be. I haven't done the curve yet. But if you get below a certain grade, I'll say, please come talk to me, right? Um, because I don't know your name, I can't track you down. So it's incumbent upon you to actually listen to me. If I say, please come talk to me, this is for your own benefit, right? We are halfway through the semester. Uh, I'm going to hopefully grade these next couple weeks. Um, come talk to me. Uh, maybe we can correct some things. Maybe we can fix some things. This is for your own benefit. Um, Please don't email me questions about the exam, ever. Don't do that. The reason why is it defeats blind grading, right? Because if you tell me, oh, professor, I did so-and-so on my exam, I will kind of know it's yours, even though I try to forget. Um, every year, whenever the exam's administered, one or two students email me, and I don't reply. I'm usually very good with email. And they get, oh, man, oh, he didn't reply to my email. It's deliberate. If I reply and actually acknowledge your questions, I defeat the blind grading. So never, ever, ever email a professor about an exam. That's the worst thing to do. Just sit and wait. They'll figure it out. And you can talk after the grade's been submitted. And this is just not for my exam. This happens every year. And I usually don't get a chance to give people advice about exams because it's after the final. But here we have a midterm that can actually talk to you about it. Uh, so don't ever email anything that can give away your particular exam. Right? Like one year, a student said, well, you know, I wrote half in the computer. I wrote question number one in the computer and question number two in a blue book. Well, there's only one student in the class who fit that pattern. Okay, they just beat the blind grading. And I you know as hard as I try not to remember what you just told me, I know what you just told me. So don't do it. And again, be on time for the exams because this is really important. Okay? Um, this Saturday, you have a Langdell, and uh, Rebecca's going to go over the midterm. Uh, I strongly encourage you to attend that. Uh, uh, she'll go over and explain what to do and what not to do. I think that'll be a very good use of your time to attend on Saturday. Uh, I will also do a review myself at the end of the semester um, in much more depth, but if you want something more instant gratification, uh, go, to, uh, go to Rebecca's Langdell on Saturday. All right, any questions before we get started? Is there any way that on the final, 
you can write the instructions on how to find the word count because it just said on the bottom character count and not everyone could find it. Okay, but did you learn how to find it now? I don't know. Okay. Um, all right, I'll show you in class at some point. Um, there, there's a, did anyone find it? How do you do it? Anyone? One at a time. How do you do it? That's the top bar. Stats. Stats? And then there's something for word count? Yeah. Okay. Did it say stats? Yeah. Okay, stats or statistics and word count. <laughs> right, and it, you, have, you have to do it. Okay. Um, this is actually one of the benefits of, of doing it midstream because you can actually get a trial run. Um, I know that the exam stuff gives you a sample test you can download and try. Um, if you haven't done that, you should just give that a go to try the word count. Okay? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. When I finish grading them. Uh, I'm gonna try, it'll probably take a couple weeks. Uh, there, it's a lot to read. There's a stack on my desk about this high. Uh, and I want to make sure I read them carefully. But you will have them probably in the next two or three weeks. I'm going to try to. Um, but I'm, I'll try and get them done quickly. Yeah. I'm not sure how accurate this is, but I've heard the professors say they they set the parameter on the exam pro and they can say like cut and paste that to whatever. So I've seen working out before at the bottom. So I was kind of surprised when I don't control that at all. I, I don't I have no unfortunate I wish I could control, but they don't let me do anything. Um uh I have no control whatsoever. But if, if, if I think the majority of you raise your hands, the feature was there. Perhaps it was hidden, but it was there. And, and if for whatever reason you can't figure out the word count, a manual word count doesn't take very long. I mean, I, I've timed it. It takes maybe one or two minutes to go through a thousand words. It's, I mean, it's, it, it's feasible for whatever reason you can't figure it out. What else? Anyway, I'd, re I'd much rather you figure out these kinks now than the final exam, which actually counts for your you know, 99% of your grade. So uh, whatever you learn now, you'll figure it out later. Yes, Earl? Um, so I think there's a lot of people that can't make some examiners. Is there any way that you can make uh, That's a good question. Let me let me ask Rebecca. I don't know. Um, I, I think the answer, let me send Rebecca an email about that. that that's a, that's, that's a, it's a, it's a fair question, and I, I appreciate that you have, you have commitments, and let me, um, let me email right now so I don't forget. I just I'll email right now because it's a fair question. Um, okay. Any other questions? Again, whatever confusion or disturbances you have now, I'd much rather you have these today than in June, December when you take your midterm or take your final. Anything else in your minds? No? Okay. So let's 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 start. So last class, if you can remember as far back as Wednesday, all the way 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 back when before uh before I, I uh departed from your presence, um we started the 14th Amendment. And I walked you through each of the provisions of the 14th Amendment. Okay. We discussed briefly how the court Nullify the Privileges or Immunities Clause in Slaughterhouse. We discussed how the Supreme Court ruled that this 14th Amendment does not apply to private actors, it only applies to state action in the civil rights cases. Therefore, Congress cannot take action to eliminate discrimination under the 14th Amendment. Our topic today focuses on a provision of the 14th Amendment that most of you probably have never actually heard of until this class, perhaps, which is Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. Okay, And I think I mentioned this last class. But Section 5 of the 14th Amendment is known as the enforcement powers. The 14th Amendment gave Congress new authority beyond Article 1, Section 8. Article 1, Section 8 lists powers for commerce and taxing and spending, all this other good stuff. The 14th Amendment expanded that. Why this is important is that the 14th Amendment gives Congress power 
to enforce stuff against the states. The civil rights case is held that Congress can't make private parties do stuff. But Congress can make the states do stuff. And usually, Congress cannot force the states to act. But a big exception to this is Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. So the cases that we're studying today explore how the 14th Amendment allows Congress to impact the sovereignty of the states in one very specific manner. Can Congress allow individuals to sue a state? Okay, this is the entirety. And we need to go back to the 11th Amendment, which I'll do in a moment. So has anyone ever actually done any sort of civil rights work or plaintiff work where they represent someone and they got beat by a cop or they slipped and fell and they sued the government? Anyone ever doing this kind of stuff? No? Okay. So I need to give you a little bit of background on federal jurisdiction, which um, most of you will probably never take a class in federal courts. I would strongly <laughs> recommend it. Um, federal court is a class of how federal jurisdiction works. Now, in CIFPRO, you do a very small amount. You know, you do diversity jurisdiction, you do your federal question jurisdiction, but this is a class they should take. They say, wait a minute, Josh, I, I want to litigate in state court. I'll be a good Texas lawyer. Fine. Federal courts, as a class, will teach you how to stay out of federal court. Just as important as getting a case into federal court is staying out of federal court. And if you're a good trial lawyer, you know how to make sure your case cannot be removed to federal court by having only all uh, non-diverse parties, right? There are ways of doing this that you can learn about. So we start with the Constitution. We start with Article 3. And we last referenced this provision in the first week of class with Marbury versus Madison. And Mar Marbury held, probably incorrectly, but Marbury held that Congress cannot expand the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. They can only make exceptions to the appellate jurisdiction, but the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court was fixed. Okay, but we need to focus on other provisions, and Article 3, Section 2 provides, the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States, okay? The Constitution speaks of two sorts of heads of jurisdiction. You have your cases and you have your controversies. Okay. I, I don't really teach much about standing, but the doctrine is known as cases or controversies. If you want to get into federal court, you must have either a case or controversy that fits in one of these heads of jurisdiction. So the easiest question that you probably study in civil procedure is something called a federal question, right? If something presents a federal question, you can have this case in federal court, regardless of whether the parties are diverse or not, regardless of whether it's diversity. Okay. Does anyone know where Congress gets the authority to create federal question jurisdiction? Right there. The reason why Congress can give jurisdiction in federal courts to federal questions is because the Constitution says they can. The judicial power shall extend to all cases arising under the laws of the United States. In other words, arising under means present a federal question. So in CIFPRO, where does federal question jurisdiction come from? It's authorized by the Constitution. One fact that you may not know, the Constitution allows for federal court jurisdiction but Congress didn't create it until the year 1875. For the first 100 years of our republic, there was no federal question jurisdiction. Basically, the only way to get into federal court was based on diversity jurisdiction. Okay? The first 100 years, there was no federal question jurisdiction. The only way to get into federal court was through some sort of diversity jurisdiction or admiralty, other things we don't really care about now. Okay. Where does Congress get the authority to create diversity jurisdiction? It comes straight from the Constitution. I didn't include it here. But one of the heads of jurisdictions involves controversy between citizens of different states. 
You'll see it right there. The Constitution specifically allows federal jurisdiction for controversies between people of different states. And I'm sure you say this is Zip Pro, but the reason why was to give a fair and neutral forum, right? You didn't trust a state court of Maryland to have a dispute between Maryland and the guy from New York, right? You have a neutral federal forum to handle these disputes. So there's not much of a dispute over diversity jurisdiction. But one of the earliest disputes arose over the one that highlighted here in pink salmon, I don't know whatever the color that is, right? And it says, Diver jurisdiction extends to a controversy between a state and citizens of another state. So the Constitution seems to create a way in federal court for jurisdiction between a state and citizens of another state. Okay. Now, uh, let's see. Do you remember where I finished last time? I oh, Aaron, good memory. I, I never remember. I stopped trying to keep track because you guys are so honest. Well, thank you, but yeah, so. <laughs> Aaron, just reading that, that phrase I've highlighted in the maroon, does it specify one way or another who's suing whom? Is it the state suing the citizen or the citizen suing the state? Okay. So one of the first things I want you to understand about this provision is it's not entirely clear who's suing whom. Maybe the state sues the citizen. Maybe the citizen sues the state. And it can be read either way. Okay. So, let's play this. So historically, going back to jolly old England, right? There was this notion, which I'm sure you've heard, the king can do no wrong, right? Or as Mel Brooks said in History of the World, it's good to be the king, right? You could not sue the crown. You could not sue the crown if the king hurt you in any way. You could petition for his mercy, but you could not sue the king. This is an idea of sovereignty, that as the king, as the sovereign, he cannot be hauled into court. So a question arose in 1776, when we declared our independence from England. We say in many respects, the, the states inherited the sovereignty of the king. They now have the power to make war. They now have the power to make co uh, commerce. They have the power to make treaties. All of the sovereignty that the king had devolved to the states. The question is this. Did the states also inherit the sovereignty so that they could not be sued? Okay. And this is much of the debate in Chisholm versus Georgia, right? Did they inherit this power not to be sued? So read right against this backdrop, we have here this language that says the jurisdiction of the federal courts extends to a case, right, between a state and a citizen of another state, right? Johnny, how do you think the court would perhaps read that language in light of this history? Uh, that the states are sovereign. And so how would you read this as? A state suing a citizen. Yeah. So one way of perhaps reading this is against the common law backdrop, right? That all this says is a state like Virginia could sue a citizen, not the other way around. Okay. This was probably the better way of reading Article 3, Section 2, but it's not the only way. So um, I'm about to go into CIPRO depth that you probably never thought of. I'm going to say one word and make you cringe. Eerie. <laughs> oh, yeah, look at that, right? Did you guys know Eerie was in the case book? I didn't assign it because I think you figure I read it. <laughs> Eerie is an important case for reasons that you didn't even learn about. Let's give you the real story of Erie Railroad. So 
preceding Erie was a case called Swift versus Tyson, which probably makes you cringe even more. I can see the faces, right? But historically, the first, I don't know, 130 years of our country, federal courts had the power of common law judges, okay? Federal courts could actually make common law. They could decide what are the correct rules for tort liability, which was the issue in Erie. Mm -hmm. Erie rejected that. Erie said that federal judges no longer have the power to make any sort of common law. They look to the state law. Probably wrong, but in any event, Justice Brandeis wrote the opinion that's now black letter law. But at the outset of a republic, judges did feel they had this power to make federal common law. And to understand Chisholm v. Georgia, you have to understand this point. I want to, I want to dwell on this for a moment because it's, 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 it's a little bit dense to get through. In every state in the Union, started in 1776, you could not sue the state. The courts all said, as a matter of state common law, you cannot sue the state. The state courts adopted this sovereignty model. Okay. Were we living in the land of Erie, federal courts would be bound by that state common law rule. But we were not living in the land of Erie. We were living in the land of federal common law. And federal courts read this provision, the Supreme Court in particular, to say, listen, we're judges. We can make our own common law. And Chisholm v. Georgia was an instance where the federal courts actually said, we are going to decide for ourselves what sovereignty means. We are not going to defer to the state common law. We're going to make our own federal common law. And under the federal common law that we create, you can sue another state as a citizen. So the case of Chisholm v. Georgia wasn't just about whether you can sue your state. This was actually an instance where the federal court, Supreme Court, was actually deciding for itself how to interpret law and not deferring to state common law. And this is an aspect that most people just breeze over. But this is why Erie was so significant. Erie put the brakes, no pun intended, on 150 years of law making by the courts. And said, we're just going to defer it to the states. Okay? Probably didn't learn that when you studied Erie. There was also a strong rejection of what's called natural law that they said, well, Federal courts aren't going to get into this business of making stuff up and natural law. We're not going to do that. Uh, but it was a very significant case. <coughs> okay. So let's start with the case of Chisholm v. Georgia. This is probably 1793. This is probably the first big case decided by the Supreme Court. And what makes this case so confusing to read is that there are five separate opinions. John Marshall, among the many things he did, was create the practice of having one single opinion for the court, where the court speaks with one voice. The old practice in English courts was to have something called seriatim. It's, it's spelled, uh, second. spelled S-E-R-I-A-T-I-M. I'm just it slightly wrong. It's a Latin phrase, which means in serial, one after another. And if you think it's maddening trying to find the holding of a case with this one opinion, try trying to find the holding when there are five separate opinions. What had to happen was you would read the five opinions, figure, okay, what's the rule? Very difficult. But John Marshall, among his many warts, did a good thing by saying we now have a single opinion for the court. It makes law students' life a heck of a lot easier. So there were five opinions in, in, in Chisholm. Okay, so Anaquanda, what were the facts in Chisholm versus Georgia? Good. Very good, yeah. So what happened? During the Revolutionary War, a lot of states issued bonds to try and get, uh, you know, money to fund the war. And one guy, right, Alexander Chisholm, uh, uh, was suing the state of Georgia to try to recover some of the debt owed. Now, as we know, very often, states decide not to pay debts after wars are over. I mean, once the war's over, who's going to make you pay it? So Naquanda, could, could Mr. Chisholm have sued Georgia 
in state court in, uh, in Georgia? No. Why not? Good. Could he have sued them in state court in South Carolina? What do you think would have happened if a South Carolina court issued a judgment against Georgia? What do you think it would have done? Probably it would have ignored it, yeah. So Chisholm said, you know what I'm going to do? I can't sue in a South Carolina court because they're not going to follow it. I can't sue in a Georgia court because they'll toss me out of court. I'm going to sue in the Supreme Court. Right? This is, what, a decade before Marbury, right? This is 10 years before Marbury versus Madison, believe it or not. Amanda, could he sue in the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction? <coughs> could Chisholm, a citizen of South Carolina, sue in the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court? Why yes? Constitution, why can he sue in the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction? It's on the board. Always start with the text. No. Which part of the which part of the of the Article Three discusses the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction? <coughs> Highlighted. What? Keep reading. Yes. Article three says when a state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. So she just says, hey, great, look, South Carolina, I'm sorry, Georgia is a party. I can go to the Supreme Court and sue, okay? I'm not going to deal with these silly little pesky courts. So unlike Marbury, who could not sue in the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction because Van Damis, you recall, is not in the uh, original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, this action arguably was, Okay. So he sues in the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction. Um, he's actually represented by the former Attorney General, Evan Randolph. There were only five justices at this point, and the vote of the justices was four to one. Four justices say he can sue in federal court, and one justice said that he cannot. So let's start, um, Sophia, the dissent by Justice Iredell. Um, it, it, it's fairly short. But Justice Iredell's dissent would eventually become the majority rule. So what does, what does Justice Iredell say, Sophia? Um, I just need to look back at the inquiry and said that the change will only be the mm. And that the states never, before we became the nation, before we became the union, the states never allowed citizens to sue them until we Yeah, exactly. So he says a couple things, right? First, he says, if we look back to the history of England, the king could do no wrong. The crown could not be sued. Okay. This was significant because every state in the union adopted this practice. In every state in the union, you could not sue the governor. You could not sue the state in state court. Okay. And he basically says... We have to look to how our history was performed and how our states uh, uh, react. Now, Rene, he didn't actually address this point, but in light of the discussion we had before in Erie, do you think that Justice Iredell thinks that the Supreme Court can displace or make their own common law about sovereignty? <laughs> Good. Why not? Yeah, he basically says, look, we have to look to what the state common law is. We can't make this stuff up by ourselves. Okay? He says the Constitution only carries into effect what the legislature has done. There's no new law here. There's nothing for courts to change. 
This is basically the Erie Railroad approach, where we look to the state common law to define the sovereignty of the crown, or in this case, the sovereignty of the state. Everyone get, everyone get that bridge between Erie and Chisholm? I've right, never seen it otherwise, but it's important. Okay. Any questions just as Iredell's descent? All right. Yes, yes, sir. I don't do the sense. He states there, oops, I think it's the third paragraph on page 559. He seems to give legislation more power over the courts. Mm -hmm. He said that the court, the legislature should not only uh, be play a part in the number of judges and uh, the application, but also on uh, the jurisdiction. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't it? I understand that judicial branch is the weakest of the three, but doesn't this kind of take the essence of its existence away and saying that if it was not for the legislature branch, you might as well not even exist. Well, that's true, isn't it? So in the Supreme Court, what's the only court that must exist? I'm sorry, in the Constitution. <laughs> in the Constitution, what's the only court that must exist? And what jurisdiction must it have? What's the only jurisdiction that Supreme Court must have? Or the one the state and the only jurisdiction that the Constitution says the Supreme Court must have is this, right? What about all other types of jurisdictions? Can the court change it? Can they eliminate it? Yeah. What about the lower federal courts, the inferior courts? Are those created by the Constitution? Who creates the lower federal courts? What happens if Congress never bothered creating any other courts? Yeah. So the point is actually well taken. Unless Congress takes the affirmative action of vesting courts with jurisdiction, there is no federal judiciary. They don't have any. Indeed, we actually discussed a case, uh, it's called Ex parte McArdle, where Congress tried taking jurisdiction. You can't hear any habeas corpus cases involved in the Civil War. When you start stripping jurisdiction of courts, courts can't act. Okay? This is an important point. I'm glad Neri asked the question. Courts can only act where they have jurisdiction. Unless a court has jurisdiction, a judge is worthless. So by eliminating jurisdiction, courts can effectively, sorry, the Congress can change the entire nature of the judicial system. Yeah, Marco? Uh, we talked before that uh, sometimes Congress can delegate its power to the president and then really the president can have a big uh, Yeah. Yeah. If Congress sets up courts through the power of the jurisdiction, it can just unilaterally take it back whenever it wants to. So the Supreme Court, I mean, it's a very tricky question, right? Because if, this, if the Congress withdraws jurisdiction, how can a court say that's unconstitutional? Right? If a court doesn't have jurisdiction to hear a case, how can you say that's unconstitutional? The Supreme Court has suggested that it may violate due process of law to eliminate jurisdiction. But good luck enforcing that. Because if, say, the Supreme Court says tomorrow, Congress passed a law tomorrow saying that uh, the federal courts will no longer have any jurisdiction over prisoner cases. No, no more habeas corpus cases. Okay, now what? Can a court say that's unconstitutional? How? Congress said you don't have the jurisdiction to say so. Once you get to jurisdiction stripping, you get into a weird nether region where it's unclear what happens. But Justice Iredell's point is, is, is correct. 200 years ago, it's correct today. Yes, ma'am. But if they're stripping jurisdiction, aren't they saying that the court can't hear certain cases? Is the case about that being unconstitutional about that topic? Yes. Because what? Think about it. Who would have standing? So it's making them, right? Congress says no more jurisdiction for prisoner cases, right? Who would have standing to challenge that? Who would be injured by that law? A prisoner, right? So a prisoner goes to federal court and says, "I am suing, saying this law is unconstitutional." The court have jurisdiction to hear that case. No. 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 Yeah, that's not, I'll affect your butt in a second, but the answer is no. By stripping jurisdiction for prisoner cases, they have to toss the case out of day one. Okay, go to the button. Well, I just was thinking, why wouldn't the case come about um, about the ability for the law to be made as opposed to? Congress has the power to establish or name the courts however they see fit. They're not required to vest the court with any jurisdiction. 
There's nothing the Constitution says even have that federal court to start with. That's very good at go. I mean, technically, the Congress just abolish all the little courts. Say, no, we'll stick with the state courts. We're fine with that. There'd be any problem with that. Supreme Court may be pissed off, but the only court left, that's it. They cannot get rid of the Supreme Court. Better question, how many justices are required in the Supreme Court? What's the only judge mentioned in the entire Constitution? The Chief Justice, because he has to preside over the President's impeachment. So technically, you can have a Supreme Court with one justice. Call him Anthony Kennedy, I don't know, might as well, right? So, um, may as well, right? But your questions are good. The, the debate you have 200 years ago is the same you have today. There's nothing in stone saying we have to have a judicial system. I mean, it's a practical matter. It's not going anywhere, but it's not in stone. Janine, Justice Blair, what did he say? Justice Blair. Really short. Um, the Constitution is the only fountain upon which I shall draw. Oh, what a beautiful phrase, right? What does that mean? Does the Constitution define this question? We, we look to this language, does the Constitution actually say one way or the other? No. Um, it just says between states and states and yeah. states. So it can be okay, good. All right, Cameron, let's move on to Justice Wilson. He was an interesting guy. He was actually one of the uh, leading advocates in Philadelphia uh, uh, of the um, uh, Constitutional Convention. He was a very brilliant judge who died an untimely death. What did Justice Wilson say? Uh, one of his first points is that sovereign is not yeah. Who is the Constitution in the name of? Three words, right? We the people. Not we the states. We the people. If you've noticed before, the Declaration of Independence speaks not of people, but of these 13 United States. The Articles of Confederation speaks not in terms of people, but here come these states in this league of friendship. Right? Remember this. But the Constitution was not ratified by the states. It was ratified by the people in the states. In fact, it was the first government in the history of humanity where actually the people themselves approved it. It was a remarkable accomplishment. So what Justice Wilson basically says is we do not have the sort of state-based sovereignty the crown had. We have sovereignty of the people, the majesty of the people. Okay? This, this ostentatious declaration of individual sovereignty and what Wilson says, it's incompatible with this notion of people-based sovereignty to allow the state to be sovereign. It is not the state that's sovereign. It is the people. Okay. Any questions on Justice Wilson? Roy, what about Justice Cushing? What did he say? He went to the wording of the Constitution and uh, kind of delved into the between state systems of another state, and he expounded on those words. Yeah. What do we make of the fact that two states can sue each other? Does that mean the states are sovereign? So if it was not in the intent in the very next clause also that a state might be made to defend it, why was it expressed as natural to Yeah. That? Yeah, so check it out this way, right, guys? The Constitution says two states can sue each other. If these states are sovereign, how can they be sued without their consent? One's got to sue the other. State A to state B, or state B to state A. It's got to go one way or the other. So he says this cannot be as it is. And the mere fact is between a state and a citizen, why do they just say when a state sues a citizen? They said between, which means it goes both ways. Okay? Uh, uh, Nikolai, and the last one, Chief Justice John Jay, who was one of the authors of the Federals, what was his um, argument? Well, he had, had several years, years to examine if the <clears throat> in what sense Georgia is the sovereign state? Uh huh, yeah. And after all that, uh, whether uh, suitability is supposed to come, you know, come, come back. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I like that one. So he said, look, giving this sort of sovereignty to a state would, quote, do violence to a principle of free and equal government, right? We do not have a nation of sovereign states. In America, the sovereignty belongs to the people themselves, not the states. Okay? So any questions of the actual reasoning? There's like five different opinions, but they generally go along the lines of the sovereignty is for the people and not for the states, 
we fought a war to reject the idea of an absolute monarch who would then be, could not be uh, brought to court. Everyone get that? So the aftermath of Chisholm v. Georgia was violent. Uh, uh, I don't mean violent in arms, but violent in words. Um, people were outraged that a state could be hauled into federal court and be forced to pay a debt. So within a year, an amendment was proposed, and within another year was ratified. Um, things don't move this quickly, but basically everyone agreed that something had to be done. And because it was a constitutional decision, they passed what became known as the 11th Amendment. Okay? The 11th Amendment. And I'm going to read it. It says, the, and in case you don't have to write that, it's right up here as well. The judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to extend to any suit in law or equity, commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state. Okay? In other words, Federal court jurisdiction will not allow a suit against a state by a citizen of another state. Okay. So Toshiba, under the plain text of the statute, you're a citizen of Texas, right? Could you sue North Carolina in federal court? No. Under the text of the statute, could you sue Texas in federal court? Under the text of this amendment, could you sue Texas in federal court? No. Why not? It says, a citizen of one state suing another state. So you're a citizen of Texas. I said you can't sue South Carolina. Can you sue Texas? I'm, I'm, I'm looking up for this amendment, 1795. What does it say? Read it. Okay. Read it. <laughs> Okay, stop right there. So could you, Toshiba, citizen of Texas, sue the state of Texas? Okay. This is a constitutional debate. If you want to really make a constitutional law professor get angry, ask him, what do you think the 11th Amendment means? Okay. The reason why is that the text of the amendment seems to do one thing. But the Supreme Court has read it to mean something very, very different. So we start here, right? Article 3, I can't reach quite this high, but it says, there is jurisdiction between a state and a citizen of another state. The 11th Amendment says, no, there is no jurisdiction between a state and a citizen of another state. It, it's verbatim. It's basically the exact same language. Chisholm v. Georgia, citizen of South Carolina, sues Georgia. So by all accounts, what this decision does is it reverses Chisholm. It says a citizen of South Carolina cannot sue the state of Georgia. Okay? But if you read this as the text says, it creates an anomaly. Right? Because as I said, Toshiba could sue the state of South Carolina. I'm sorry, Toshiba could not sue the state of South Carolina, but she could sue her own state. This is a weird anomaly, right? It doesn't, doesn't make sense. So what should the Supreme Court do when they're faced with this kind of riddle where the text of an amendment would, would basically create this bizarre situation that the only suits against states can be by residents of their own state? And this brings us to the case of Hans v. Louisiana, 1890. And again, if you want to make a law professor go nuts, say, was Hans v. Louisiana correctly decided? And they'll, they'll just go apoplectic. Marco. So what happened in those hundred years? Ah, oh, so remember what I said at the outset of the class. When did Congress create federal question jurisdiction? 1875. Before federal question jurisdiction, Marco, what was the only way to get to federal court? Uh, federal question. There was no federal question yet. No diversity. diversity. And if it's diversity jurisdiction, does that involve a state? No, what's diversity jurisdiction? 
Citizens. Citizens. For basically 100 years, the only federal cases involved diversity. Citizen of suit A to citizen of, of, uh, of state B. Almost every case was based on diversity jurisdiction. There were no federal question cases. But in 1875, Congress finally creates federal question jurisdiction, right? So what was the federal question then, uh, uh, Kevin, in, I'm sorry, oh, I skipped over you, I'm sorry, Jennifer. What was the federal question then in Pond, Louisiana? Yes, exactly. Believe it or not, this is a jarring thought. Before 1875, you could not sue in federal court for a constitutional violation. Well, right? That's why you don't have any cases from back then. You could not sue in federal court for a constitutional violation. We haven't done Dred Scott yet, but we'll do that in a couple weeks. Do you know what Dred Scott was about? Diversity jurisdiction. Why was Dred Scott about diversity jurisdiction? The only way he could sue in federal court was if he was a citizen of Missouri. If he was a citizen of Missouri, he could sue in federal court to vindicate his emancipation. The court said he wasn't a citizen, wasn't a person to begin with, right? But the entire case was about diversity jurisdiction because that was the only way to get to federal court. He could not sue for a violation of any constitutional right in federal court. Not until 1875 did the federal court start having federal question jurisdiction. So the question uh, Jennifer mentioned a second ago, what if a state violated the contracts clause? They owe you money, they just abrogate the contract. Before 1875, did you have a remedy? No. States were free to violate constitutional rights, and federal courts would not hear your case. So to Marco's question, that's why you didn't have any states been called into court. So this case in 1890, roughly 15 years after Hans, uh, after federal question jurisdiction created, was like the first big test case. Okay, now Jennifer said correctly, Hans had purchased some debt uh, uh, he had purchased a bond from the state, and the state owed him about $87,000. Um, I ran the math on this, that's about $2 million in present day value. So we're talking about a very significant quantity of money, about $2 million. bucks. Okay, Louisiana ratified a new constitution, which I guess what, we're not paying our old debts. Too bad. This happens very often. This is the same facts in Chisholm, that the, the state wasn't paying its debts. Okay. So Hans brings suit. He says, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm a citizen of Louisiana. I can sue my own state. Look, read it. It says, citizen of another state. I can sue my own state. So the reason why this case makes law professors batty, right, is this one should have been really easy. Yes, under the 11th Amendment, as the text reads, you can sue your own state. Fine. But that's not what the court holds. Kevin, how does the court go about analyzing this issue? How do they get past the fact that the text of the 11th Amendment seems awfully clear? Uh, they, went, they went back to the, the framers of the Constitution and uh, they analyzed the Constitution and everything that they go back, back in the federal and they, just, uh, it, they didn't think that the state should be able you should be able to sue your own state. Why not? Because the uh... how do they contend with the fact that it says in plain English up there that you can't sue your I'm sorry, a citizen of one state can't sue another state. How do they get to the fact that you can't see your own state. How do they get there? <clears throat> Brian, you want to give it a go? Uh, sure, because uh, you're saying that all states are sovereign and they can make their own decisions. But is that what the amendment says? Jennifer, what do you think? I'm not sure. I was just focusing on the, the, the just kept coming back to the sovereignty, but I didn't, I didn't bring up any attention to how they, how they were pursuing what the left amendment, I just really recently 
Yeah, isn't that something, right? Yeah, it's not. So, I mean, all three of you are correct, right? Your your, your confusion is, is, is warranted for, for once. No, it's, it's – <laughs> this is a decision where the court base says, yeah, we know what it says, but that's not what they meant, right? You know, like state means federal, penalty means tax, right? That's not, that's not what they meant, right? They basically say that Justice Iredell's dissent that spoke of the sovereignty of the states, this is what the 11th Amendment was trying to incorporate. The 11th Amendment was trying to put into law Justice Iredell's dissent. Okay? Even though that's not what it says. And they say it like this, look, you have a decision that's so unpopular that the people ratify an amendment. Right? The people as sovereigns ratify the amendment. This is the interpretation they would prefer. The highest authority of the country, the people, agreed with Justice Iredell. So even though Justice Iredell only was discussing the, the aspect of suing another state, he spoke much more broadly. So the court says is, we're going to listen to Iredell. This is where it's at. This is how we read the 11th Amendment. A state must consent to be sued. If a state doesn't consent to be sued, then too bad. Right, and so was the Supreme Court basically adopting this common law rule, or were they making up their own rule? Yeah, so basically they say we're going to follow what the state courts have done for 200 years. The Supreme Court majority basically says Chisholm was wrong the day it was decided. The majority says Chisholm was wrong the day it was decided, and the 11th Amendment fixed that. The 11th Amendment restored the original meaning of the Constitution of states and sovereigns. Why would the people want that? Why would they want that right to Ah, you tell me. Why do you think, as a, as a Texas taxpayer, you, may, you would not want Texas to be able to be sued? One wants to other states. <laughs> but that's exactly the issue, right? Is there any cost when you, as a Texan, sue Oklahoma? Does that bother you at all? Does that, does that affect your taxpayer standing at all? If everyone could sue a foreign state, right, there's no repercussion against me. If you sue your own state, you know, you're a member of that polity, right? There's actually a cost there. Now, one point I make clear, a state can consent to be sued, right? States can allow themselves to be sued under very certain circumstances. So say if Texas injures you, right, in, a, in an intentional tort. If a Texas Ranger commits an intentional tort against you, beats the living daylight out of you, right? Texas will allow them to be sued in a Texas state court under certain circumstances. So it's not that there's no remedy, but the state control of the matter which can be sued. We're going yes. I'll get back to so Chisholm basically the Supreme Court said you're wrong. We're gonna now a year later to take the eleventh amendment in seventeen ninety five. Yeah. But at that point in seventeen ninety five there is no reason to put the language that a citizen should be able to sue his own state under the judiciary question because it's not there yet. It's not oh, oh no no, but the constitution authorized it, right? Look. The judicial power prosecuted against one of the United States. So there was jurisdiction where one citizen was suing a state, right? It doesn't specify here which citizen's prosecuting it. So the Supreme Court had the original jurisdiction for a suit involving a citizen against a state. So they could have, right? Marco, what if Chisholm v. Georgia was never unpopular, right? What if they liked Chisholm? The next year, could someone have then sued could a Georgia citizen have sued Georgia the very next year if there was no 11th Amendment under this provision of the Constitution? Uh, on a court, on a yeah. Federal court. Yeah. Yeah. At that point in time, there is no federal question. Right? It, not on a federal question, though. The, 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 the question is, so actually hyper-technical. In 1795, there was federal question. They repealed it. They repealed it shortly thereafter. So I omitted that fact. but. Assuming there was federal question. 
Yes. Sorry, I, I, it, it was around briefly for a couple years, and they got rid of it and brought it back in 1875. So, but for a very brief period, they did have it. Okay. So what does Justice Harlan say? Nuri, what Justice Harlan is a short, and again, Justice Harlan is my, one of my icons, but uh, he knew more about the Constitution than anyone else. He, uh, he used to teach, uh, one of my great projects, he used to teach uh, a constitutional law at George Washington University while he was in the Supreme Court. He taught evening, he taught night students. Imagine you're a night student in law school instead of having me, right? You have a justice in the Supreme Court teaching constitutional law. Uh, it's, it's remarkable. And the cool part is, one of his students transcribed his lecture notes verbatim the entire semester. And then I actually uh, put them online or a thing about it. They're, they're remarkable to read, but he was sent there for two hours and just talked about the Constitution from memory without, without any notes. Um, and he would always talk about cases that were pending. And he'd be like, you're going to read about this case in a couple weeks, but don't say I told you. Uh, he didn't expect some idiot with a blog to be writing about it two years later, uh, or a century later. But Justice Harlan knew so much about the Constitution and the history. He was a smart guy. So Nuri, what does Harlan say? Um, he says that he does agree with this court in this opinion, that a uh, uh, state should not be, a uh, citizen should not be able to uh, state, but he does not agree with the schism, and he believes that the schism court did interrupt the Constitution. Yeah. So Harlan's like this. When Chisholm was decided, it was correct. The Eleventh Amendment reversed that. But he's saying that Chisholm was a correct statement of constitutional law before the Eleventh Amendment. Okay. Harlan alone. You raising your hand or scratching? Okay. Scratch that. All right. So any questions on Hans? The case basically says it would be weird to allow someone to sue their own state but not a foreign state. So we're just going to treat the 11th Amendment as if it means you can't sue any state. I can't sue Texas. I can't sue New York. I can't sue any state. So does that mean that I can't sue the government? No. No. In fact, I can sue state officials. Right? So there's a case called Ex Parte Young, which I don't think you've ever heard of, but if you ever want to do any civil rights litigation, you'll have to know about it. Ex parte Young was 1908. Ex parte Young, the facts were like this. Even though you can't sue the state for money damages, okay, what if a state official, not the state, but a state official, like the Railroad Commissioner of Texas, right? What if a state official is violating your constitutional rights? You can't sue him for damages. Okay, but you can sue him for what's called injunctive relief. You can get an injunction saying, stop him from violating my constitutional rights. So there's actually an exception to this doctrine that you can't sue the state, where you can sue a state official for some sort of injunctive relief to stop him from violating your constitutional rights. And that case, which I haven't assigned, but you're welcome to read, is called Ex Parte Young, 1908. Okay. Um, another exception, which I'm sure you've studied, is Section 1983. Did you guys say this is Pro? Section 1983 allows you to sue a state official if they deprive you of a civil right. So you always see a police brutality suit, right? They're depriving you of your Fourth Amendment right not to be seized. You can sue a state official under 1983. Anzalo, you know about 1983? Tell us about 1983 from your experience in law enforcement. What do they tell you not to do? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's funny. It, it, you, it's almost like almost anything that you do yeah. can be construed under 1983. So it really had a, chill, I to say this in the other place, it had a chilling effect on how police officers did uh, starting, like, I guess, the 70s. Yeah. So the reason why... Anzalo can be sued. So believe it or not, 1983 originated in a law called the Ku Klux Klan Act. Okay? And effectively what you had was you had members of the southern government in the southern states basically violating constitutional rights and working with the Klan. Wait, we just said that you can't sue a state, right? The 11th Amendment says you can't sue a state. But 
What came after the 11th Amendment? The 14th Amendment. The second half of our class, one of the more trickier concepts, is how the 14th Amendment modifies the 11th Amendment. The 11th Amendment says you can't sue a state. But the 14th Amendment allows Congress to modify that rule. The 14th Amendment gives Congress the power, and here's the phrase that uh, that that I'll be using over and over again. But the 14th Amendment gives Congress the power to abrogate sovereign immunity. What the hell does abrogate mean, right? It basically means cut or infringe upon. The states have sovereignty. The states have sovereign immunity. They can't be sued. But Congress can use its 14th Amendment powers to cut off or abrogate a state's sovereignty. Okay? Let's go down to the Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. Okay, and it says here, the Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. Okay, so, uh, Okay, so, uh, uh, Michelle, uh, let's say, um, let's say, you know, we're shortly after the 14th Amendment is ratified, and let's say Mississippi passes a law uh, saying that, uh, you know, all freed slaves are required to turn over their property, and we will not pay any just compensation, okay? And you're a freedman, right? And you go to, you go to a state court, and you try and sue Mississippi. What's the Mississippi court going to say to you? I'm sorry, I can't sue Mississippi court. You can't sue Mississippi court because the state's sovereign, right? Okay, you walk into federal court in Mississippi. You try and sue the state saying, look, they just took all my property. They didn't give any compensation. Well, think, what will the federal court say to you? I think the same thing as we said. Yeah. The 11th Amendment would apply under Han v. Louisiana either in federal court or state court, you cannot sue. But the 14th Amendment changes that calculus because Congress, if they find a constitutional violation, Congress can remedy a constitutional violation by allowing people to sue the state. This is why Anzalo is worried about people suing him, right? He's a state officer. The reason why he can be sued is that Congress passed Section 1983. Section 1983 cuts short Texas sovereignty and allow someone to go straight to a federal court and sue Onslow, which would did you ever get sued? Talk about that later. <laughs> did you ever did you ever lose? Ah, but victorious, right? Marco. That's only on federal question. Oh, oh. So under what circumstances can Congress cut short or abrogate a state sovereignty? Okay? The answer is in section one of the fourteenth amendment. If a state violates one of the guarantees of the 14th Amendment, if they deny someone equal protection, if a state or a state officer violates due process of law, if the state denies someone the privileges or immunities, right? If a state violates Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, okay, I'm going to scroll back down, Congress has the power to enforce the provisions of this article. The provisions of this article mean Section 1. If a state violates Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, Congress can then use its enforcement powers to allow people to sue the state. So while it's usually we can't sue a state in state or federal court, Congress can pass legislation to allow people to sue the state. Okay? Congress can cut short a state's sovereignty to remedy a constitutional violation if a state is violating something in Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. So, kind of what he said, it would always be a federal question at that point, because the only way it's going to go in is if it's constitutional. Yes. If a state is violating a constitutional right in Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, Congress can allow a citizen to sue that state. Congress can cut short a state's sovereignty. I won't get that point. Right? 
Usually if a state, you know, passes a law saying, you know, all freedmen have to go to their property, I mean, that's a clear violation of equal protection, very clear. I mean, that's not, even, that's not even a close call, right? But under the old rule, you can't sue in state court, you can't sue in federal court. But if Congress passes Section 1983, that allows us to go to Onslow when he starts racially profiling people, right? Then, you know, yeah. then, then we're in business. They deserved it, right? Yeah. <laughs> they had it coming. Look, look at allegedly that little wink. You can tell he was on, on the stands like allegedly, you know. <laughs> but the point is this, right? If in fact, if, not Oslo, but if in fact the Texas police officer is engaging in racial profiling and discriminating in violation of equal protection, because there's a constitutional violation, Section 5 allows people to sue to remedy that, right? Congress says, look, we can't pass a law to stop every act of a constitutional violation. Let's let the people sue. Police officers respond to suits, right? You respond to damages. When you when your department's paying all this money out, you 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 hear about that, right? And you said it modifies in be, your behavior. Yeah. So this was a strategy of the Fourteenth Amendment. The way we stop constitutional violations by letting people sue in federal court, right? We open up the federal courts to allow suits against the state to remedy these constitutional violations. Michelle. Yeah, so I'm quite curious. So when Congress uh, wrote the Fourteenth Amendment, uh, where did the um, implied meaning of liberty, meaning the Bill of Rights? Ah, uh, give me two Sorry. minutes. I'm gonna okay. get there in two minutes. All right. Yeah, that, was my, that was my next point. You're like two steps ahead. Yeah, I, I promise to get there real soon. Okay. Everyone with me? So everyone get that point that if the constitutional violation. Congress can allow a suit to remedy it in federal court. That you can sue for damages against the state. Everyone with me so far? Yes, ma'am. And that, does that have to be between um, a citizen of the state that they live? Any the citizen. You okay. can sue any state you want. It's, it's, it's an open license. So effectively, Section 5 of the 14th Amendment carves out the 11th Amendment. Section 5 of the 14th Amendment creates an exception to the 11th Amendment. Why? It's later in time. And subsequent amendments can actually affect earlier amendments. The same way we have prohibition, and then prohibition was repealed, right? A later amendment trumps a earlier amendment. Okay, everyone with me so far? Only in areas where Congress hasn't acted. Right? Section 5 only kicks in when Congress passes legislation. If Congress does not pass legislation, the other amendment applies just fine. Right? So Congress said, we'll pass legislation, 1983, that says if there's a constitutional violation, you can then sue the state. What if, you know, you just have a dispute with the state? They're not, you know, they're not mowing your lawn or they're not cleaning up the trash inside your, your, your house. That doesn't violate the 14th Amendment, right? You can't sue the state for any damn reason. You can sue them only with a constitutional violation. Well, South Dakota Dole was actually the state suing the federal government. <coughs> the federal government. Right? Okay. We haven't really done many cases where an individual sues a state or sues the federal government. We haven't done any of those cases so far. Okay. Mm -hmm. Everyone so far. Now, the question Michelle patiently asked, and I, I will get back to, is that there's some, there, there's some words in the 14th Amendment that aren't quite clear what they mean. So we discussed last week these privileges or immunities, right? And I explained in the slaughterhouse case, the court said, don't worry about it. They don't mean anything. Wrong, but, you know, this is the world that we live in. But we get down to this phrase, nor shall any state deprive any person of life liberty or property without due process of law life liberty or property without due process of law timothy um what is liberty in its essence it's freedom uh, freedom of movement freedom To basically be able to have your own will, I guess. Not okay, so you're a judge, right? You're reading the 14th Amendment. You have your little handy pocket constitution. It says liberty. 
What does that mean? Well, I would take it, I guess, in the context of the 14th Amendment, I, I would say that maybe if you were a freed man and a state tried to deny that or deprive you of your freedom that they were that they gave you, that would be depriving you of your liberty. Okay. Slave. What if what if the state passes a law saying uh, no more newspapers, can't publish any newspapers, too dangerous? Yeah, that's freedom of the press. Yeah. But well, we go to the First Amendment. It says Congress shall make no law. Right. Not the Second freedom of the press. How does the First Amendment then control the states? How is it? Right, exactly. What if a state wants to ban newspapers? How does the First Amendment control the states? Control the states. Uh, I, I would say that it's the First Amendment controls the states. Uh, like we were just saying earlier, that um, since this is the 14th Amendment, the First Amendment, the 14th Amendment kind of applies retroactively. Actively. Does it say that? Is there anything in the 14th Amendment that says we are applying retroactively the First Amendment? Is there anything that says that? No, but they. I guess under Section 5, they have the power to enforce through legislation, I guess. They but could. of this article, right, it says uh, uh, to, to uh, enforce the provisions of this article, being the 14th Amendment. Is there any – I've called you enough. I'll move on. Uh, Michael, is there anything in the 14th Amendment that suggests – that suggests that the freedom of the press should be now extended to the states? It's not expressly written for the state. But – I'm going to the but – probably could be implied the same as what we did in the previous case. And, and, and how would we imply? What word would we focus on? The intent of... What word, what text, what word would we focus on to imply? It? There's only so, so many words up there. So we're back to the life, liberty, or property. Which word process. do you think gets you there? Which word you just said? With liberty. Liberty. <clears throat> okay, so this is a topic we'll discuss later. But virtually the second half of your book, and I'm only slightly exaggerating, focuses on one word, liberty. Okay? What is the meaning of liberty? Okay? I'm going to give you a preview of things to come. But throughout the 20th century, the Supreme Court ultimately came to the conclusion that this word liberty includes the first eight amendments of the Constitution. Not all of them, most of them. And it's in a very ad hoc, random manner. All right? Oh, I skipped this room. You guys had off. I'll come back. I just realized. It. Sorry. <laughs> I was uh, looking, you guys. The Supreme Court ultimately held, to have had 80 years of case law, that the word liberty includes the provisions of the first eight amendments of the Constitution. Okay. As a result, the First Amendment protection of freedom of the press was extended, or we say incorporated to the states. That's the magic word, incorporation, right? Was a liberty interest so strong that states could no longer deprive you of it? And this took about 80 years. And ultimately, the Supreme Court said, yeah, freedom of religion, states can't deprive you of it. Freedom of speech, states can't deprive you of it. Freedom of the press, states can't deprive you of it. In 2010, the right to bear arms, the state can't deprive you. It took them a little while to catch up with that one, right? Everything is being done through this one word, liberty. Abraham Lincoln had a great expression. He often said, how was it? I don't think liberty means what you think it means, like a princess bride type deal, right? Uh, we all have different interpretations of liberty, right? Liberty, yes, if you're unsure. Thank you, Siri. <laughs> I don't know what I said either. Exactly. That was actually really perfect. That was timed well. Good job. That was like the most the, the perfect Siri outburst. I don't know what you mean either. So the long and short of it though, right? The long and short of it is that the phrase liberty was was come to embrace everything listed in the first eight amendments of the Constitution, including the free exercise clause of the Constitution. Okay? And that is what's relevant for the first case. We'll do today. Uh, City of Bernie versus Flores. So it was a nice 20 minute introduction to a case. Now you get another couple introduction, right? 
So one of the provisions of the First Amendment is what's called the Free Exercise Clause, right? The Free Exercise Clause, which guarantees the rights of free exercise. Now, um, we will do this case later, but I'll give you a brief summary. There was a decision in either 1990 or 91, I can't remember the year, called Employment Division versus Smith. Employment Division versus Smith. And the facts of the case were like this. Oh, I rhymed it. Um, you had an employee, a guy named Smith. He was Native American. And part of his religious rituals <coughs> involved the use of peyote. Okay, everyone know what peyote is? It's a kind of a cactus thing. It's a hallucinogen. Uh, if you take it, it makes you a little bit trippy. Uh, but it's a very important sacrament in various Native American faiths. Okay. So he lost his job in part because he used this peyote. It was a controlled substance. It was a drug. Um, and he lost his job. He then applied to the state for unemployment benefits. And as I'm sure I hope none of you know, if you get fired from your job for breaking the law, you don't get unemployment benefits. I'm sure none of you know that. But you will not get your benefits if you're fired for breaking the law. He sued, and he said, wait a minute, right? How can I be denied my unemployment benefits for exercising my religion, right? My religion says I have to use this peyote. I used it. You know, no one got hurt. You know, this went to the Supreme Court. And in a very controversial decision that people still don't agree on, Justice Scalia said, too bad, Mr. Smith. Why? The law was generally applicable. The law said to everyone, you cannot use drugs. It didn't single out Native Americans, didn't target Native Americans, and everyone applies equally. And if you have a law of general applicability that doesn't target any specific faith, then you cannot bring this sort of lawsuit. And Mr. Smith lost. Okay? So the Supreme Court interpreted the free exercise clause very, very, very narrowly. And by the way, the reason why we have Hobby Lobby in these other cases is because of Justice Scalia's opinion. Uh, history has a good sense of irony. We'll talk about this later. But a year after Employment Division versus Smith was enacted, Congress became very upset. They said, how can it be? How can it be that a Native American who uses peyote for his religion can be denied unemployment benefits? That's just wrong. So Congress, by a wide majority, I think it passed almost unanimously in the Senate, President Clinton signed into law. I mean, Republicans and Democrats agreed. And the law was known as RIFRA. Okay? Here, I'll spell it out for you. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And it's abbreviated as just RIFRA. You know, like you know, McGruff the dog, grr, right? RIFRA. The purpose of RIFRA, we don't actually know what the purpose was. But what the law, <laughs> this is actually an issue in Hobby Lobby. What did RIFRA actually do? We'll get to that later this semester, right? But as its name would suggest, at a minimum, RIFRA tried to restore the First Amendment to what it was before Justice Scalia got through with it, right? It's like hitting Control Z, right? They were trying to undo Employment Division versus Smith. They were trying to restore how the Supreme Court had interpreted the Free Exercise Clause prior to the Smith decision. Exactly what it did, we don't know. And, you know, this law is like 20 years old, we still don't know what they did, right? But at a minimum, it was trying to undo Justice Scalia's decision in Smith, the Peyote case. Okay. So what did the law say? If a state imposes a substantial burden on your religious exercise, you can sue the state. If a city imposes a substantial burden on your free exercise, you can sue the city. Okay? Under Justice Scalia's test, you couldn't, right? You could not bring a suit against the city under Justice Scalia's test because the law applied neutral to everyone. But under RIFRA, they said, yeah, if a city poses a burden, even if the law is neutral, you can sue. Now, this law implicates sovereign immunity. Why? Because it abrogates the state's sovereign immunity. It allows you to haul a state into federal court. Okay. So the question becomes, 
Does Congress have the authority to enact RIFRA? Does Congress have the authority to abrogate state sovereign immunity in this case? All right. So the facts of the case were actually like this. Anybody know what Bernie, Texas is? Not too far near San Antonio. I'm from there. Yeah, from there. Do they go to the church or no? Okay. I actually had a student a couple years ago actually went to this church, which is kind of cool. So we had a situation, right? St. Peter the Apostle a Church in uh, Bernie, Texas. Uh, I was actually in Philadelphia the other day, and I saw the stuff with Pope. Everything was still crazy. Uh, the Pope was there. But you had uh, St. Peter the Apostle Church in Bernie, Texas. Um, it was a thriving church. They had all these people. They couldn't fit everyone inside. So the church says, you know what, we want to apply for a, um, you know, a, a building permit. It's a very beautiful church. We want to apply for a building permit to expand, and that way we can reach our flock and, and, and have a mass, or have a critical mass, I suppose, uh, have enough people to pray. Okay? <laughs> they apply for the building permit, and the city says, no, I'm sorry, your building is a historical site, too damn bad. Um, you, you've taken property too, right? Uh, You'll take property due this semester, right? Semester. Oh, I won't have you. Okay, I'm doing property one next semester. Okay, any anyway, Generally speaking, zoning law is considered very, very deferential. Whatever the government wants to do, they can do. If they designate something historical site, that means you can't build, right? And if the state says you can't build, generally speaking, you cannot sue them because of sovereign immunity. Texas does not allow you to sue the state if you're denied a building permit. It's a very specific procedure you have to go through. You can't just go to the federal court. The Archbishop, Mr. Flores, sued the city of Bernie. And what did he allege? You violated our free exercise rights. Now, he did not allege a violation of the First Amendment. Because remember, the Supreme Court said the First Amendment says if it's a general law, like a zoning law, they're not targeting you for religion, you can't sue. Instead, he said his religion was burdened under RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And he wanted to sue a city, which is he's a subdivision of the state, so it's like suing the state. He wanted to sue a city for damages. Okay? Now, this case did not turn on whether, in fact, denying a building permit did violate his religious liberty. The case turned on whether Congress had the authority to abrogate sovereign immunity with RIFRA. Okay? So we start again with the text of the 14th Amendment. Uh, I'm sorry, Tam, we'll go, oh, we'll go back here. Tam, we'll start down here, okay? So under the 14th Amendment, what sort of laws can Congress pass to enforce this provision? What does it say? I'll, I'll scroll down because we don't really care about most of it. What sort of laws can Congress pass? Law related to the provision of this article. Okay, good. The provision of this article. That's the key word, right? And we said the major number one word in this article is liberty. Okay? The entire decision turns on this one point. Who gets to define what a constitutional liberty is? Supreme Court. Can Congress, Tam, define what a constitutional liberty is? Okay. The entire case turns on this one point. Justice Kennedy, writing for the majority, basically says this. We, Supreme Court, we decide what a constitutional liberty is, not Congress. Uh, 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 Daryl, was Congress trying to work with the Supreme Court's definition of liberty or make their own definition of liberty? They're trying to make their own. They're trying to say, we're going to almost create a new right. Exactly. With RIFRA, according to the majority, Congress was trying to expand the definition of liberty. Congress was trying to add on to what the Supreme Court had already said. Justice Kennedy says, no, 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 no. That's our job. 
we are the only ones who get to decide what the word liberty means. It's a very John Marshall style approach, right? Only the court gets to decide what freedoms are. And there are a couple of explanations of why, and some are more persuasive than others. But one of the points that Justice Kennedy says is, listen, if Congress can make whatever they want liberty, and they can define it for themselves, they basically have a virtually limited power, right? If they can say whatever they want is liberty, they can do whatever they want. By allowing the courts to define it, it puts a check on where Congress can actually legislate. Okay? Any questions on that part? This is an important decision. So I'll give you an example, right? I get asked this question at least once a week now, all the time. Could Congress pass a law that requires every state to issue a concealed carry permit for a handgun? Could Congress pass that law? Anyone take a stab at it? Daryl? Wouldn't it violate state sovereignty? Exactly. The 14th Amendment does violate state sovereignty, allowing someone to sue the state, allowing a state to actually recognize a license. But that's what the 14th Amendment does. The 14th Amendment allows Congress to violate state sovereignty. But the initial question is, can Congress say that the Second Amendment is violated when you don't have a concealed carry license? Can they say that? Anyone take a step? Exactly. The Supreme Court has not yet held that the Second Amendment applies outside the home. It almost certainly will at some point, I hope at least, right? But they haven't so held. Congress cannot expand Second Amendment rights until the Supreme Court says so. So until the Supreme Court says having a concealed carry permit is a constitutional right, Congress cannot legislate in this sphere. That the liberty provision of the, of the 14th Amendment is a Supreme Court domain. That Congress cannot expand those rights. Everyone see this? Yeah, Sarah. So the Second Amendment was partially incorporated. The right to bear arms at home was incorporated, but, but they've not touched outside the home, unfortunately. Okay. Now, any questions on that? The second part of Justice Kennedy's opinion focuses on this word, appropriate. Okay. Uh, Nina, can Congress pass any sort of laws it wants to enforce civil rights, whatever it can think of? <clears throat> what is the limitation on what types of laws Congress can pass? Right in the section five. Appropriate. You know, what does it Well, in language, right? What, what does appropriate mean? It's fitting. fitting. Oh, oh, beautiful. Perfect word, right? Effectively, there has to be a fit. I'm, I'm glad you used that word. That was my favorite word. A fit or a connection, right? between the constitutional evil and the means used to fix it, right? You have a constitutional violation and you have some sort of means to fix it. There has to be a close fit there. So to use this case as an example, right, Marcella? What was the violation alleged in Bernie, right? What, what did they actually complain about? That they were violating the How? By not allowing them to expand their church to, to allowing. Does that seem like a really serious infringement of religious liberty? No. Okay. So the constitutional evil is that you're being denied a building permit. Big deal, right? But what are the means being used to accomplish that? What 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 did the, the, the archbishop try to do here? Exactly. So effectively, they're saying is for something trivial that you can't get a stupid building permit, the Congress is allowing you to sue the city, basically take an entire domestic property law and turn it into a federal issue. You'll learn this in property too, but federal judges don't like handling zoning issues. They hate this stuff, right? Because federal, local, federal courts say, let people do their own damn zoning. It's not our business. 
So you have this, this connection between the means, right, and the ends. And let me, let me do a little writing for a bit because this is a – you have the means and you have the ends, right? So the means here is suing a city. And the end is, uh, 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 you know, no zoning permit, right? They say there's not enough of a fit. The injury, the injury of not getting a zoning permit does not justify the extreme act of letting someone sue the state, right? We, we've held under under Hans of Louisiana that the states are sovereign. Abrogating sovereign immunity is a very big deal, and you cannot do it for light reasons. That's be a serious reason. This is not a serious enough reason to abrogate sovereign immunity. Any part of this uh, concern by the federal courts and over here some kind of floodgate of litigation that they can't handle? Oh, yes, because indeed, this could very much turn almost every local zoning dispute into a federal case. Right? What the court is saying is that we are not going to allow states to be sued. We're not going to let them, their sovereign to be given away for something stupid and trivial. It's got to be a very big deal, right? So there are two aspects of the holding of Bernie that I want you to understand, right? First, it's up to the court and the Supreme Court at that to define what are the liberty interests protected by the 14th Amendment. The court defines the liberty interests as protected by the 14th Amendment, not Congress. And the second is that Congress can only enact appropriate legislation where there's a close fit between the thing they're trying to accomplish and the, and the, the constitutional evil. Okay, and on that second point, there's a phrase used in the opinion. I like Nina's word much better, but this is the this is the word used in the opinion: congruent and proportional. Okay, that just means, as Nina said, fit, right? The constitutional evil and the 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 the, the, the means you're going about it has to have a nice fit. You cannot abrogate immunity to get people a zoning permit. That's not a big enough evil. There has to be a fit between the means and the end, a fit between the approach and your goal. Okay, uh, you can say it differently. Uh, the fit between the um, between the approach and the goal, right? What are you trying to achieve, and how do you get there? That's be a very tight fit. If there's a very severe infringement on state sovereignty or some trivial zoning permit, that ain't gonna fly. You need a serious Problem and a approach narrowly tailored to that end. Okay. Questions? Make sure you get this. This is one of the trickier doctrinal parts of the class. Jane? Is the means the city and the ends for the zoning permit, or yeah. is that the switch? Hmm. The means is allowing the city to be sued. Right, the means is allowing the state to be sued. Right, and the end is that they get the zoning permit. Or that should be denied, depending on how you phrase it. Right? There has to be a congruent proportional fit between what you're trying to do and the approach you use to get there. Right, you cannot allow a state to be sued just for fun. And, and this is actually in contrast to things like necessary and proper. Right, necessary and proper basically means whatever is convenient for the government. Congress can do. But for Section 5, because you're dealing with state sovereignty, they need to have a much tighter fit between what they're trying to accomplish. So is this a place somewhere that Congress cannot advocate the state sovereignty to make things not happen? They were saying that they don't have, have a better. Congress can only abrogate state sovereignty when it's congruent and proportional to the, to the, to the end. So they can't abrogate only when it's. Yes. Okay. Congress can only abrogate state sovereignty. When, when the, the, the thing they're trying to do is congruent and proportional to a constitutional injury. Right? I can say it 18 different ways, but it's the exact same sentiment. There has to be a fit between what they're trying to do and the means they get there. They can't infringe sovereign immunity just for fun. This is a big deal. Yes, Michelle. But this is where SCOTUS comes in, and in a sense, they're the, they're the holder of what? The they hold the key. 
I mean, this is also the Supreme Court asserting for itself that Congress can't define constitutional rights. Even though that's not necessarily true. And in fact, if you read that Congress can enforce this legislation, you think that Congress inside what a constitutional violation is. Bernie is a very um, uh, uh, controversial case, and not everyone agrees with it. it, it and um, I'm sad they didn't really include the dissent there. I mean, just as kind of like a paragraph, that's not the main dissent. Uh, I'm, I'm sad they omitted it. Okay? So let's give some examples, right? In the follow up cases after Bernie, they list a couple of the, the short cases, right? In this one decision, Kimmel versus Florida Board of Regents. Kimmel versus Florida Board of Regents, right? Okay, what happens if a state engages in age discrimination? A state engages in age discrimination. Can Congress allow a citizen to sue the state for age discrimination? Right? No. Okay. That the problem of age discrimination is not that big of a deal to allow states to be sued. You may think it's unfair to discriminate the basis of age, but the court said that's not that big of a deal. You have this other case called Board of Trustees versus of Alabama versus Garrett. Okay, what happens if a state violates some rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act? The state discriminates against disabled persons. Can you allow the state to be sued? Supreme Court says no. Right? There's not a big enough evil in disability discrimination to allow the state to be sued. What the court's saying is you need a serious constitutional violation not being denied a zoning permit, not disability discrimination, a serious constitutional violation to allow you to be suing a state and violate the sovereign immunity. <coughs> but, in the last case in the trio is perhaps most important. Nevada Department of Human Resources versus Hibbs, the 2003 decision. This case concerned provisions of the FMLA, the Family Medical Leave Act, right, which basically says uh, 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 employers are required to give 12 weeks of unpaid leave, not paid leave, but unpaid leave to help someone with a sickness or to care for someone with a sickness. Was this enough of an injury to allow someone to sue the state? And in a decision by Chief Justice Rehnquist, the court said, yes, Congress could do this. Why? They said that the Family Medical Leave Act was necessitated by decades of gender-based discrimination. Specifically, women who were being terminated because they had to become pregnant and couldn't go to work, Congress was trying to fix this problem of, of gender-motivated discrimination. Because gender discrimination is considered a very big deal under the Constitution, we'll do this later, this was sufficient for Congress to abrogate a state's sovereign immunity and allow the state to be sued. Okay? This also represented Justice Ginsburg's victory because she finally persuaded Justice Rehnquist to, to, to go along on this. She was very happy about that one. But like, unlike other cases, the law was narrowly targeted that if a state denied a woman or man this medical leave, it would directly impact this sort of gender-based discrimination. And it's also quite narrow. It only affects employment. It doesn't affect all aspects of zoning or other things. So you have these three cases. You have Kimmel, you have Garrett, and you have Hibbs. And, and go back and reread the summaries later. But these more or less say only for a very serious constitutional violation can Congress abrogate a state sovereign immunity. It's got to be pretty big. Zoning won't cut it. Gender discrimination will. Are there any questions on Bernie or those three cases? Yes, ma'am. Well, the ADA came before Garrett, right? The ADA requires uh, various businesses and interstate commerce to install various accommodations for people with disabilities, right? The question here was, what happens if a state violates the ADA? Can you sue the state directly? Right, so if a private business fails to install a ramp and you can't access the handicap, can you sue them? Sure, no problem, right? What if the state refuses to install a ramp at a school? Usually in the 11th Amendment, you can't sue the state. But if Congress tries to abrogate that sovereign immunity, that means you can sue the state because Congress, using the 14th Amendment powers, cut out that sovereignty. That makes sense? Marco? The Supreme Court said that it's not a big enough 
I'm sorry, what was you say, say a question again, please? So the Supreme Court on the ADA basically said that these people with disabilities are not the issue. It's not a big enough. Yeah. Yes, yes, no, exactly right. Congress is basically saying that this issue is not big enough that we can't get around the 11th Amendment. We start with the presumption that states are sovereign, right? And you only get around the 11th Amendment if it's a big deal. Now, are there political checks against the state for discriminating? Of course, right? There are other methods to hold the state accountable, but not a direct lawsuit. Other questions? Okay. Any other questions on Bernie? We'll do Morris in a second. All right. So the last case we'll have for today is called um, United States versus Morrison. So this case has two important aspects. Okay. The first case, I'm sorry, the first aspect which they edited out of your book was the Commerce Clause. So we studied United States versus Lopez. This was a gun-free school zone act case where the court said that a gun in a school zone was not commercial activity. It was not economic activity. Congress could not regulate it. The next law, the Violence Against Women Act. Okay. Congress passed a law that's actually Joe Biden's favorite law, which was meant to eradicate gender-based discrimination. Okay. Um, this, the, the facts of this case are actually quite sad. So this is Christine Grazon Coppola, who was the plaintiff, and uh, she was a student at Virginia Tech, and uh, she met two guys, Antonio Morrison and James Crawford. Uh, these were football players in Virginia Tech's big football school. And uh, Grazon Coppola claims that she was assaulted and raped by these two guys. Okay? She stopped attending classes and withdrew from college. Uh, what happened to the two guys? Well, one of them was suspended for a couple of semesters, and that suspension was waived. Um, for whatever reason, the prosecutors did not bring any sort of criminal investigation, um, and they weren't helping her. So, could she sue the state? Right? Could she sue Virginia Tech, which is a state institution in Virginia court? The answer is no. Could she sue Virginia Tech in federal court? The answer is no. Could she sue the two, the two football players? Of course she could, but they don't have any money, right? So she wants to sue the deep pockets. She wants to sue the state. So one provision of the Violence as Women Act says, if you are the victim of gender-based violence, you can now sue a state in federal court. Okay? If you are the victim of gender-based violence, you can sue the state in federal court. The first aspect of the court's opinion basically says, that violence is not commerce. Violence is not commerce, and Congress cannot regulate violence. That this is an activity that the local governments are equipped to handle. It's a police power issue, and the federal government does not have any authority over it. The second aspect of the case, the one that's most important for us, affects the suit. The question is, can Congress abrogate the state's sovereign immunity? Can Congress allow Christy Brazoncala to sue in federal court against Virginia Polytech University? Okay. And the question becomes here of one of congruence and proportionality. So Pamela, what does the court hold here? Uh, Whoa, wrong Pamela. <laughs> Whoa, that's kind of creepy. Yeah, go ahead, this one. <laughs> Surround sound, yeah. This is Pamela. Sorry, I'll come back to you later. Okay. Yeah. All right, Pamela, go for it. Why? I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So effectively, the court says here, right, we have this test, congruent and proportional. What is, right, what are the means here? The means are suing the state, 
allowing Christopher Zancala to haul the Commonwealth of Virginia into federal court. And what is the end? Okay. And this part, be very precise about. No one's alleging that the state assaulted her. The allegation is that you have these private individuals who assaulted her, and the state did not enough to prosecute them. Okay. If you think that requiring the state to issue a zoning permit is a big deal, right? Requiring a state to launch a criminal investigation is a far substantially greater deal. And what the court basically says is this is a serious incursion to the police power, something that's very, very remotely associated with the, with the remedy, right? Her real grievance is not against the state. Her grievance is against the people who assaulted her, or she claimed. So the, the law, the court says, is not corrective in nature. It's not trying to correct any sort of constitutional violation. Okay? All it's doing is trying to provide a way for people to sue the state. And there's no clear constitutional violation issue here. Okay. Um, the court also explains that, and this, this part was a little bit of a flimsy reasoning, uh, that effectively the court, the Congress hasn't demonstrated that the problem of domestic violence against women is significant enough. Right, that there's not enough of a record of a constitutional violation to justify this holding. Um, I think there's one part where they said only 21 states had this, so I guess the other 39 are okay, whatever the numbers were, right? This part is a little bit of a flimsy of the holding. But effectively, by applying this Congress proportional test, they say there's not enough of an evil here to appropriate and to haul the state of Virginia to federal court. Okay? What does Justice Souter say in his dissent, uh, 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 Joseph? Um, I think he focuses on the fact that the state has to uh, provide an adequate remedy. So they didn't provide an adequate remedy. Uh, that's kind of very state action. Right. So effectively what the dissent says is that by not providing a, pro a, a prosecution, an adequate state remedy, there was in fact a violation of the Constitution. Um, the problem with the dissent, though, is it's not clear what provision of the Constitution they're talking about. Right? We'll talk about the Fourth Amendment. Right? Criminals get due process. Victims don't. And this is one part of the Constitution people don't like, but victims have no rights under the Constitution. And this is actually a very controversial aspect of do victims actually get any sort of uh, proceeding. Um, Classic example is a confrontation clause, right? You have the right to confront your accuser. What if there's a rape case and the accuser's a minor? Various rape shield laws try to shield the uh, minor from the uh, uh, accusation. It's unclear if those are, those are even valid, uh, as perhaps uh, uh, worthwhile as they seem. So Morrison is an extension of Bernie, where they basically say, hauling Virginia to court to remedy a failure process is not a sufficient goal. It's not congruent proportional. And Ju uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist writes at the end, if the allegations are true, no civilized system of justice would fail to provide her a remedy. Right? But under our federal system, that remedy was provided by Virginia and not by the United States. So effectively, Bernie B. Flores and United States Morrison put a serious crimp on the power of Congress to abrogate a state sovereign immunity. The only big case which allows that sort of suit was the Hibbs case, which I mentioned, the Nevada case, where the prospect of gender discrimination tied to family Lee was allowed. But this was a bridge too far for the Supreme Court. Uh, these cases aren't perfectly reconcilable, right? There are some tension between them. But as it stands now, Congress is a very serious lift. They want to abrogate a state sovereign immunity. So I'm going to bring up a kind of sidebar case. There was a case back in the 80s called Thurman versus City of Torrington. And that was the first case where a police department was sued um, because they failed to arrest a domestic abuser. Uh, before that, cops had kind of just made it a family problem. After that, um, a guy almost, you know, he stabbed his wife and almost killed her. He was arrested for 10 times. After that, you know, we began this era of almost mandatory arrest, right? They're almost compelled, like if you have a scratch, the cops no longer can make it like just, you know, an issue. You would get, you would get arrested. So my thing is though, if, if in this, and that was like 20 years before this case, 
if she was raped and attacked and whatever, and the state didn't take an action, could, could that not be something that says, hey, you have an obligation? And I think that case was an equal protection case. In other words, the police at that time failed to protect her, in essence, mm -hmm. um, from attack. Right. So, so the shorter answer is, is a very close fit, right? You have an individual. The police stopped by. They saw she was beaten. They didn't arrest her, right? There's a very, the time, right. There's a very close fit between the officer not arresting her and the victim. Here, there's no allegation investigation even occurred. In other words, she was suing Virginia Tech, even though her true enemy was really the police officers who didn't go after them, right? And they didn't, you know, campus police didn't do an investigation. There wasn't, there wasn't that fit there. Got it, okay. okay. Any questions on Morrison? So, so the cases for today, and this is kind of a one-off unit, discuss when Congress can step in to cut short a state sovereign immunity. Uh, the Supreme Court has basically endorsed Justice Iredell's opinion in Chisholm and made state sovereignty ultimate. And only in very narrow cases can Congress go about uh, 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 abrogating the state's sovereign immunity. Um, and in cases of uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and the Violence Against Women Act, they couldn't. And both Bernie and Morrison fit in with the broader trend in the 90s of these important federalism cases. This was right around the time of Lopez, right around the time of Prince, right around the time of New York for the United States. In case after case, the powers of Congress to true state sovereignty was paired back by the Supreme Court. And these were two of the very important cases in that genre. Any other questions? No? Have a great night, and I will, uh, I will be in touch soon. Thank you. I'm sorry? I didn't have to embarrass myself. Never, never embarrassed.